Today, would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 11? We've been working through that chapter, and, and we're just, I'm actually going to read from uh, verse 7 to the end of the chapter, but our focus today is going to be on uh, verse 16 and forward. So we read there, Matthew 11, starting at verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the, in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethesda! Bethsaida! If the mighty works had been done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have uh, repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for you on the day of judgment uh, sorry, more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will be, you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Those are some of my favorite verses in Scripture. I don't know about you. Come to me, all you who are heavy, weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want to begin today with something that seems to take a jump sideways, and it's one of the questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. For anybody that was in the first class, we're working through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. That is a great distillation of the theology of Scripture. If you want to know what Scripture teaches, this one's really, it's just magnificent to read through it. And among the bl many blessings, it ends by this whole discussion of the Lord's Prayer. Like, what is, what are we thinking, what are we praying when we work through the Lord's Prayer? And the question that I wanted to ask is this, what, what doth the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? What doth the preface of the Lord's Prayer teaches us? And what, what is the preface of the Lord's Prayer anyway? You know what it is. It's the first couple of words of it, our Father which art in heaven. What does the preface to the Lord's Prayer teach us? And it says something interesting. It says, the preface to the Lord's Prayer, which is our Father, which art in heaven, teacheth us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a Father able and ready to help us. I'll just stop there. That's not actually the whole answer, but that's what I want to just focus on. Did you notice these two words? We're to draw near to God with what? These two things that might seem in tension, and I don't want to say they are in a kind of tension, with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a father. 
When I read this, it's, it's a very interesting thing because this is, captures the double-sidedness of God, if you will. This is the beauty of the gospel. In Jesus, in the passage we just read to me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says to us, really, come into my presence. You, you, as you are, come. But at the same time, Scripture always reminds us that our God is a holy God. In fact, the whole Old Testament is really about, actually, don't just come into my presence. Right? Think about it. What is the Bible about? Let's take a 30,000 foot vantage point here. Let's go way up in the sky. What's the Bible about? On the biggest possible level, it's saying one thing. This is the introduction. You are sinners. That human beings, because of our sin and rebellion against God, find ourselves in exile from him with whom we were supposed to be in communion. We find ourselves in exile from the source of life and blessing. And what do we do about that? That's the central problem for human beings, is that we are exiled from the God who created us to be in communion with him. That we can't have blessing, not real blessing, because we're in a world that's separated from God. Why? Because of our sin. What's the whole Old Testament about? The whole Old Testament is about God setting up this mechanism, we'll call it the Old Covenant, whereby he says, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to set up residence right in your midst. But there's one big important thing you got to remember. If you want to survive with the holiness of God in your midst, you better respect the holiness of God. The whole system, the whole Old Testament is about an affirmation of that truth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's what it's about. That's what the Old Testament is about. There's one thing you got to remember. God is holy. You don't just go traipsing into the holy of holies. You will die. God is a consuming fire. And so he, the whole entire system here is you can go, who can go into the holy of holies? Do you remember this? First of all, for the, for the temple itself. Only priests could go into that. So in our NIV study Bible, you can see cool pictures of the inside of the temple. But you wouldn't have seen that in ancient Israel, right? You didn't have the NIV in cool color pictures back then. But you never would have seen it. You would have it described to you. Oh, the splendor. But you would never have gone in unless you were a priest. And even if you were a priest, you never would have gone into the Holy of Holies unless you were the high priest. And even then, only once a day, only once a year right, on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, and only then, not without blood, and with a robe, a special robe, and with a rope tied to you in case you should die in the presence of God, they didn't need to pull you out, and little bells that they want to hear you tinkling, or they'll start pulling, right? It sounds almost funny, but it's kind of like, this is the principle of the holiness of God. Then we come to the New Testament, and it's this picture of God as our Father, God as our Father in Jesus Christ invite, inviting us to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that beautiful? So often, we do this horrendous theological thing. This is what I want to talk about today, where we separate these two testaments as if it's two gods in conflict with each other, or something like that. The God of the Old Testament is here, and he's the mean, nasty, Jewish, old-fashioned God. He's all angry and everything. And then you have the new God, Jesus, who's just kind and loving. And we set these two things in opposite. God used to be this way, but now he's this way. I don't mean to be irreverent about it. I'm saying that's how probably a lot of rank-and-file Christians actually look at the world without thinking about it too much. But we want to affirm here definitively right now, what? Definitively right now that the God of the Old Testament has not gone anywhere. That God has not changed. That God is the living and true God and ever will be. His character is that. He is holy. He continues to be holy. Everything is still there. That God of the Old Testament is the God that we worship this morning. What has changed? Jesus has come into the world. And that changes everything. Ooh, that's what I want to talk about today. Exactly how do we work this? These couple of verses are actually among my favorite in Scripture because I respond to it personally. I have a proneness to discouragement. Many of you do too. How could you not, actually? I, I've come to see that discouragement in a, in a world going insane is a sign of sanity. <laughs> Right? If you're not discouraged, come talk to me after class, because I think we should be. <laughs> Looking at it from the flesh, as people, there's a ton of reasons to be discouraged. But I'm not discouraged, not in the deepest sense. Why? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
because it is this promise of God in Jesus Christ that we live for, that we lean into and find our hope and blessing in the midst of a hopeless world. Right? Amen. May it ever be so. But here's the thing for me. And I think for many of you, too, when we read scripture, we tend to see now this is Jesus being his inviting mode, right? What's interesting is we parachute in. If you pull that out as the one verse, well, then Jesus is just, that's what Jesus is, right? Oh, yeah, just come to me as you are. That's all it's about. But as we're going to see right before that, he was talking about Sodom and judgment and all this other kind of stuff. That's like, well, that doesn't sound like the friendly Jesus, you know? So sometimes we, I want to put this together. How can we read what Jesus is saying so that we understand it? We have a grasp of God's holiness and his mercy at the same time. That's what I want to work on. I find these passages, especially chapter 10 and 11 of Matthew, a little difficult this way. And I want to share with you that, just kind of working through. Okay, that's my goal for this. So what I want to do is back up. I haven't done this in a while, and I think it's useful sometimes to sort of review the big picture. Otherwise, we kind of have this way of dropping into scripture and you're caught on a flow, right? Today is this passage and the next week is this passage and they're all kind of separated from one another. Actually, Matthew is one big whole. What's it about? What's Matthew about? And let's just say this. What Matthew's about, here's a good first shot at it. Matthew is about establishing the great truth, the fact that Jesus is the promised one who was to come. That one that was promised to Abraham, the one who was promised to David, the son of Abraham, the son of David, it is he. He is the one, he is the king of Israel, the promised king, and he comes proclaiming the kingdom and bringing the kingdom, and he comes with kingdom authority. Let me make it short and memorable. Jesus is the king, and he comes with kingdom authority. That's what Matthew's about. And we saw how in the first nine chapters of the book, it establishes this great truth in a series of three, what I'm going to call P's. Again, these are just tricks to remember it, right? What is it? Well, in the first part, is it shows how Jesus fulfills it in prophecy and then proclamation and then power. Chapters one to four, Jesus fulfills all the prophecy of the Old Testament. I'm not going to go into that now, but all those things in the Old Testament that talk about the coming of the Messiah, where he's going to be born, what his name is, what his character is, the whole thing. Egypt, all these pieces that kind of fit together marvelously into the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to do it. I can't even resist the temptation. Even the part with the devil. Remember, the devil uh, pulls Jesus out into the wilderness. What's that about? Why is the devil tempting Jesus in the wilderness? You remember, and there's the devil throwing verses at him, and Jesus is handling these verses. Sometimes we think, and I think this is rightly, by the way, that Jesus is like a new Adam, that whereas Adam failed the test in those temptations, to, to sin. Jesus didn't. Exactly right. Right? Um, that's not wrong. But I just want to say that's more Luke what he's teaching there. There's something Matthew's getting out here that's a little different. And what Matthew is saying as well is that Jesus is actually the faithful king. It says in Deuteronomy that the promised king of Israel is one who knows, who knows the word of God and knows how to handle it. So when Jesus answers the devil's misuse of scripture with the right use of scripture, he's showing here's the true king. Oh, isn't that cool? Okay, I'm just saying, the whole first four chapters are one gigantic picture of how Jesus fulfills all the prophecy of the Old Testament. And then it shifts. Chapters 5 to 7, Sermon on the Mount, Proclamation. Jesus then talks about the nature of the kingdom of God, and he shows himself to be the king. How? Because he's speaking about what it is to be a disciple in the kingdom. They say this, you've heard it said, but I say... What is that showing you? Showing you his authority. Those who hear my words and do them are water. You're like a guy who builds his house on the solid rock, right? My words. At the end of it, the, the crowds were amazed. Do you remember why the crowd was amazed after the Sermon on the Mount? It's because Jesus taught as one having authority. Authority. And then the third section, I'm going to, for some reason, I'm thinking of this as three parts. So you guys over there, it's the power part, right? Then... Matthew shows that Jesus is the Messiah, is the king who comes with kingdom authority through a series of works of power. Again, there's a way of remembering this as a series of S's, if you think of it. First, Jesus shows his power over sickness. 
And you remember there were a series of healings that he did that are just phenomenal. First, there's the, the leper, and he heals the leper. You're not supposed to touch a leper, right, or you become unclean. Jesus brazenly in front of everybody goes and touches the leper, and what happens to him? Is he made unclean? No. By the power of the Holy Spirit, not just is Jesus not made unclean, but the leper is restored. He's cleansed. Ooh. The next guy, the centurion servant, what does he do with him? Jesus doesn't even have to touch him, doesn't have to be near him. I don't need to touch the person at a distance. Jesus heals the centurion's servant. We see Jesus is amazed by the faith of the centurion, this Gentile. And then you see Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law. And what does she do? After she's healed, she gets up. He puts his hand on her. She's healed. She gets up and serves him. Beautiful picture. Jesus has power over sickness. If that's not enough, then in the next scene, Jesus has power over the storm. Right? The, they're in the sea and they're, they're panicking and the waves are rocking back and forth. They're like, Jesus, help. What does he do? He calms the waves with a word. He rebukes the waves and winds and they're calm. And they're like, whoa, not only does he heal sickness, but he can calm the storm. He has power over nature. And if you thought that was cool, not only does he have power over nature, but he has power over supernature. He gets to the other side of the lake. And what does he do? He, he casts out the demons. He has power over Satan. Does anyone remember the word that he used to cast out the demons? It's a very simple word. Go. If you've ever seen the Jesus movies, which I've seen all of them, I, we should, you know, but you see the Jesus movies, they've come to drive me crazy. This is why we should be careful with Jesus movies sometimes, because it, it, it's they, very often you'll see Jesus summoning his strength or something. And it's like, oh, you know, and it's like, it's ridiculous. He just says, go with one word, right? With the word, he banishes the satanic dominion of this person. What do we see? Jesus has power over sickness. He has power over the storm. He has power over Satan. And then even more, he has power over sin. You remember the scene with the paralytic? And he, he really annoys the Pharisees here. It's just that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth, has authority on earth to do this. Your sins are forgiven you. What? Okay, we won't get into that. One more thing. We're just catching up through this. Finally, you see that he has the power over death. The little girl who had died and Jesus raises her from the dead. Boom. That'll blow your mind. Do you see how in a series of things in the first nine chapters of the gospel according to Matthew, Jesus is established with overwhelming power according to prophecy, according to proclamation, and according to works of power where God is working through him. He is the king who was promised to Israel. He is the Messiah. He's the son of God. And he comes with kingdom authority. So what? What does that mean? He is king. You better listen to him. <laughs> That's what it means. Got it? Isn't that a great summary? Amen. Amen. <laughs> it was pretty good. You can remember it this way. Then we get to chapter 10. And I'll be honest with you. As, as someone, this is my job. Is to, sh I guess, suppose one way to think about it is to share my love of scripture. I struggle with this section, chapters 10 and 11. Not because it's so hard to understand particular pieces of it, but because I've struggled to understand. It seems different when we get to chapter 10 and 11. This, it shifts to more of talk of persecution. Let me explain. So we've gotten up to this point, and at this point, having established that Jesus is the Messiah, it begins to shift from establishing that he's the king to now focusing more on what's the kingdom like? What's the kingdom like, okay? We'll be talking about this more as we go ahead. But if you remember, chapter 10 was the sending of the 12. It was Jesus' second great discourse. And the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, is, you could call it this, it's like a call to discipleship. What is it? And this is a call for every one of us, for you, for me, for Peter, for, for all of you. It is a call to discipleship. What does it look like to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Come to me. Come to me. Follow me. How? How shall we do it? In this way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so on right through the list, through this incredible discourse, right until the end. Those who hear my words and do it are like a man who builds his house on the rock. Now do that, okay? It's a picture of discipleship. Now this other one, chapter 10, is different. Chapter 10 is a call to apostleship. So the first one is a call to discipleship. In other words, how shall I follow Jesus? Come to me. What shall I do? The other one is where Jesus calls us to be apostles, to go forth. The one says, come. The other one says, go. Got this? 
So the Christian life is this thing where it's this oscillation, right? There, there's these two things. We're to come to the presence of God, to sit at his feet, to learn from him, and then we're to get up and go forth. So far, so good. But where I get bothered in chapter 10, if I can use that word, is then he starts talking about persecution. Do you remember this? In chapter 10, he's like, I'm going to send you out there. This is what you're to say. You're going to be my witnesses. I'm giving you authority, by the way. I'm sharing you some of my authority with you. You're going to be casting out demons at this attestation of the word. Good. But you know, when you go out there, I'm sending you as sheep among the wolves. And there's going to be division out there. They're going to be delivering you over. And they're going to be flogging you. And you're going to be suffering all kinds of persecution, but don't be afraid because that's actually the way the Gentiles are going to hear it. This is God's plan. This is how the gospel is going to go forth to the end of the earth, kind of by your pain a little bit. And I'm going to lead the way. Persecution is going to be a mark of the church. And division, families, the gospel is going to come in and it's going to cause divisions. You remember this in chapter 10 between sons and daughters and, and children and parents and all this kind of stuff. Don't think that I've come to bring peace, Jesus says. I've come to bring a sword. The sword of truth is going to divide. Now, we can talk about chapter by chapter, you know, little sections, but what I want us to think about here is why does the kingdom bring conflict? Did you ever think that? When I was a, a new Christian, I was so grateful for the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount. I got it. It's Jesus in rabbi mode. I just loved it. I, I look at the Sermon on the Mount and I just, I love it. I was a little less crazy about this one. Well, well he's telling me I'm going to be persecuted, if indeed, if I understand this right. And that one I'm a little less crazy about. Can I have this Jesus, but not that Jesus? Apparently not. You understand? So this is what I want to grapple with is this I think it's an important question to ask this question what why is there so much persecution involved why is there so much struggle and conflict when it comes to the kingdom okay as I said this is a big review chapter 11 comes along do you remember how chapter 11 began we skipped the first six verses is where John is sitting in prison and he had doubts about Jesus he was like I don't know I had these expectations I told everybody you're coming with a winnowing fork you're going to cleanse the Romans or something I thought you'd come with fire and throw them all out and I mean I see it you're healing people that's awesome but where's the fire Jesus are you the one we, we're expecting, or should, I, should we look for another? You remember? What was Jesus' answer? Jesus' answer was very interesting. He didn't say yes. He didn't say no. What he said is, John, in a sense, what he's saying is, I want you, John, look anew with eyes that focus on the whole of God's word. Look anew and see what's happening, and this will answer your question for you. Look and see what's happening. What do you see? Well, I see lepers being cleansed. I see the dead being raised. I see the gospel being preached to the poor. I see, I see people being healed. Ah, you see all of this. These very signs of the kingdom. Right? What do you see? So much of the gospel, so much of the power of the gospel is about God, Jesus, showing us how to look at the world aright. I just want to start with this thing. We look at the world through these eyes and we get all worldly about it. And God says, no, 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 you need my word. Lean not on your own understanding. Come to the word of God, right? Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. The unfolding of your word gives light. Your word makes wise the simple. I want you to come to the word of God and understand and see the world anew. I used the example of a, of a rainbow last week. Did anyone see the rainbows this week? It was really lovely. And everybody I know, you know, I walk around my neighborhood because I've become one of the lunatics that walk around my neighborhood, <laughs> right? And uh, it's kind of nice. I'm finally meeting the neighbors. Oh, hello, hello, you know, <laughs> it's like all this kind of stuff. And it was really fun because when you see a rainbow, we all stop. It's just such an amazing thing. Everyone's just dumbstruck. It must be pretty funny from some perspective of God, just looked, oh, you know, it's so pretty, you know. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, spiritual, not spiritual. Everybody looks at it, it's like, that's pretty, you know. And it is. It's just so beautiful. But I just want to say, as a Christian, it, God helps us to see that right. It's even more than just a pretty thing there. It's even more than just an effect of the weather. It is a sign of God's promise written into the heavens. When I see that, as a believer in the Lord, I see God's promise right in front of me. His promise that he's going to sustain this world until the fullness is done. And I'm, I'm gratified by it. 
And you know, the world is filled with God's promises. When you look at it in the light of God's word, instead of this kind of crushing hopelessness, we get this lift and this realization, wow, just look at things that are right and remember his promises. This is what Jesus is saying to John. The disciples go off. Then what happens? Then we're up to what I just read today. What happened next? Now the crowd is maybe doubting John. It's like, look at this John. Now we, he thought he was all of that, but now we're wondering if his teaching was any good. He says to the crowd, what did you expect to see? A prophet, yes. And what do you see? Do you see what I'm saying? He's having the crowd look. And what do they see? What you're seeing here are all these signs of the coming of the kingdom in your midst. What you're seeing is actually the fulfillment of the Old Testament right here, right now. I want to read these two verses. Chapter, uh, verse, sorry, chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, because these are key. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Ah, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? Now, look at that. Among those born of women, there is arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Don't you dare look down at him. We live in a culture which just loves to do that. We are living in a culture which sometimes I think the most egregious violation, you know, where do you even begin in our culture? If you think of the Ten Commandments, hey, what's the, this is a fun game you could play with your family. Which commandment are we most violating as a society? Which is the one that's going to bring us to, the one we'd probably forget that I think about a lot is this one the fifth commandment you remember what that is honor your father and your mother honor those in authority oh man the united states whatever the west seems to be oriented around a complete and utter reversal of this a destruction of this a complete dishonoring of those in authority if you think it's a complete annihilation of the concept and it's disturbing and really bad when we look at this, you think there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And Jesus is kind of saying to them, hey, you know, be careful about despising someone greater than yourself. It reminds me in Romans 11 when Paul is saying the same thing. You, you Gentiles, praise God, by God's grace, you were grafted into the vine, which is Jesus. But don't you despise your elder brother, the Jews? Who do you think you are? Right? You Christians, Christian anti-Semitism, you're going to look down at the Jews, your older brother? You're a wild shoot that was grafted in. Do you think he can't take you out, right? This is this kind of, God does not like it when we despise our elder brother. And Jesus is saying this, there's been no one born greater than John. Do not you despise him, the crowd. But then he says something else. He says, nevertheless, the one who's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does that mean? What it means is that there's something so great about the kingdom of heaven that it's even greater than even John the Baptist. What is it? This is getting to what we're talking about here. Okay, last thing, and we'll get to our passage. Last time, it's this word um, on the violence, right? The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. That word, take it by force, what does that mean that the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence? Have you ever struggled with this verse? Have you ever read it and been like, what in the world is Jesus talking about here? If you think about it, it could go either way. Either, either the kingdom of heaven is suffering violently at the hands of its enemies. I mean, bad people are attacking the kingdom of heaven. Or it means that, let's say, people who desire the kingdom of heaven are, are laying hold of it because I want it so bad and I'm going to hold on to it for my dear salvation. Which one? I don't know yet. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It could go either way on this. But what I want to emphasize is this last word there, take it by force. Do you remember there was this Greek word we did a study of, and I want to remind you of this, this Greek word arpazo, which means that the violent, take it by force, the violent, the, the violent men arpazo, the kingdom of heaven, they take it by force. So that word means to plunder, to rob, but also it refers to God catching us up to rapture. <laughs> it's an interesting word. So let's review this because it has everything to do with the passage today. Do you remember in Jesus' parable of the sower, when the seed is thrown on the pavement, I'm pointing out there at the street, what happens to the seed that's thrown on the pavement? It bounces up. There's no soil to catch it. What does the devil do with that seed? The, se the devil comes along and arpazos it, snatches it up. 
right? So what do we have there as a picture? Is that the devil is looking forward very much to snatching the seed away from us. God is sowing the word and the devil sitting there, whom would love to take it from you as soon as possible. The devil is about snatching it, robbing us of it. Okay. But then we saw Jesus doing an example of binding the strong man to arpazo him. Do you remember this? That parable of Jesus where he's talking about the strong man. Now, I always used to think that parable is that the strong man is the good guy. Isn't, you know, the Christian is the John Wayne character or something, and he said, you're supposed to be strong and defend your house so you don't get robbed. Maybe so, but that's not what the parable's about. That parable is a picture. Jesus is the one who's plundering, who's arpazoing the strong man. What? Who's the strong man? The devil. The strong man is the devil. When you say that word strong man, think of Saddam Hussein. Think of it in that sense. Think of, think of Antichrist, that, that the Jesus is coming in to the devil and plundering the devil. What's he plundering him of? Us. He's liberating those encaptured to the world, the flesh and the devil. Think about this. It's 1 John 3.8. What does it say there? What was the reason that the Son of God came into the world? The reason the Son of God came into the world was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil, to completely uproot it, to eradicate it from the earth, to liberate those in bondage, to liberate the world that's held in bondage to futility. Jesus has come in as an act of war, of holy violence against him who is holding his people bondage. Do you see this? It's important. Because this is where we start getting into why the conflict is here. Why is there conflict? Because, because the coming of the kingdom isn't just some peaceable thing where it's like, oh, well, take it or leave it. The coming of the kingdom into the world is an invasion of the darkness by the light. It's an invasion. When we pray, thy kingdom come, what are we praying for? We're praying that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed, that the kingdom of grace may be advanced, that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. Come, Lord Jesus. So what do we have here is a picture of like the devil is at war with us seeking to snatch our salvation away, whereas Jesus is seeking to snatch us away from the devil. Interesting picture there of this. Moreover, what we're doing right now, this proclamation of the gospel, in spite of my manifold weaknesses, right? All flallibility. You could look at me and think a thousand things that are ridiculous about me right now. I'm sure. Nevertheless, Praise God. God uses his word through our words and our witness in our life. Right here, right now, when the gospel is being proclaimed, Satan is bound. As long as the gospel is proclaimed in this world, Satan is contained, is somehow bound that the gospel can go forth and liberate people. Isn't that amazing? But it's an act of war. It's an act of holy violence. It is the light invading the darkness and taking his people from it. Jude one twenty three speaks about this, that what the, self, what the gospel does, we save others by snatching them out of the fire. What am I getting at in all of this? I'm trying to say that the message of the kingdom is not a matter of teaching, not primarily. It's not a matter of teaching or behavioral modification. What is it? It is a matter of uttermost life and death. It is a matter of war of battle, of salvation, of deliverance. And if we don't get that message, we don't really get the gospel. It's not just about, oh, if you do this, then you'll be fine. It is a matter of deliverance from the strong man who holds us hostage. So too with our sanctification, right, in our lives. This is war against our flesh, against the old man, against the old woman. Understand this. Understand this. When God says, come, to, come as you are, I want you to come as you are. It means I want you to come. Don't be afraid. You're my child. Jesus stood in your place and bore this, the penalty that was yours to bear. Come before me. But that doesn't mean your sin is okay. It means that judgment, you shall surely die. That message that was given to Adam and his progeny, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. All that is not in Christ is under God's judgment. That part of our flesh which is in rebellion against God is under God's judgment. It will die. And our job as Christians is to let it die. May everything that is not in Christ in me die. Amen. Mortify the sin. When I first became a Christian, I, I had no idea how much of the wonderful me I was actually had to be mortified. 
I, it's just kind of interesting. I'm really glad that God in his grace does it the way he does. That's actually where I want to end all of this because it's important. But mortification of our sin, sanctification, our walk, our growth in holiness is holy war. What has ever happened to holy war? And, you know, in the Old Testament, they had holy war. Now we don't believe in it. Oh, yes, we do. Holy war is sanctification. Holy war is the preservation of the peace and purity of the church. And one last thing I just wanted to say, just two verses here. What comfort there is in this. My sheep, Jesus says this, my sheep hear my voice and know them. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will arpazo them. No one will snatch them out of my hand. The devil will not snatch us out of his hand. No one can. Why? Because we're his forever. He is our God. He is faithful and just. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And he is powerful. Praise God. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, will be arpazoed together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Oh, listen, isn't it a shame that these verses are so divisive in the church? We hear this sometimes like, oh, that's a bad verse. We don't want to read that one. Why? Oh, that's the rapture, you know, and Baptists go crazy about this. We're all fighting about it. And it's like, actually, let's just chill for a second and actually hear what it's uh, encourage one another with these words. I don't know about you. I can't wait. <laughs> what it's saying is that the Lord is coming and we will be drawn up with him in glory. Oh, that's what I want. This is, and by the way, in, in accepting this, you're just accepting what it says in Scripture. You're not necessarily, there's a whole bunch of other baggage about the rapture with premillennial dispensationalism that we're not talking about here. But this is this picture that when Christ comes again, whoom, oh yeah, encourage one another with these words. We will be snatched out of this into the glory, into the presence of God, into the ages of ages. The reason I'm sharing all this with you is because it is absolutely imperative to understand this, is that the coming of the gospel is not simply this kind of coping mechanism. I feel it sometimes. It's like the gospel is proclaimed. It's like, Lord, you know, we're just hurting, and, but thanks. It's, it makes me feel better. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not about that. This is about sheer deliverance from death to life. This is the message. It is nothing less than life and death. It is holy war against the dominion of darkness and an invasion of it. And we are part of it. Make no mistake. And what Jesus is saying to us when it talks about persecution, yeah, the world is going to push back. Don't be surprised when you try to take the straight path and walk the straight path that God calls you to in a twisted world. When you start bending away from it and trying to hold that straight path, it's going to get hard. The pressure is going to be on you. They're going to be asking you to bend and then they're going to be demanding you bend and they're going to be putting pressure on you. Praise God who is faithful. Praise God because of Jesus who stood in my place, who did it first. Praise God we don't have to do it ourselves. Praise God every hope that I have of heaven is because of him and not one bit myself. Praise God that when he looks at me, when he looks at you, he's not wondering what about this, what about that. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows every flaw you have and what he's interested in is making you holy. He's preparing you for glory. He knows your weaknesses, but he also knows strengths in you that you know not. Look to Christ, who is your strength. 100%. When God looks at you, this is important, what he sees, 100% is the righteousness of Christ made yours. There is not one bit. When I think, am I going to get into heaven? It's like, it's only because of Jesus. Only because of Jesus. Only because of Jesus. At the hour when I'm about to expire, and that twinkling of an eye when I'm going to be preparing to see the Lord, whatever I'll be thinking, as, as scared as I may be just because of the unknown, just oh, how's this going to feel? I don't know, all that kind of stuff. I know this, that in the twinkling of an eye, I will see the Lord. That's worth it. Because of what he did. Amen. But make no mistake. All right, now, let me uh, read this. Actually, we'll get to today's reading. <laughs> it's just like, is he going to do today's reading? Yeah, and really quickly, because all of this was leading up to that. The kingdom of God is not a matter of behavior modification, but of spiritual deliverance from bondage. 
So Matthew 16 to 19, he says, what shall I compare this generation to? It's like, a, it's like children sitting in marketplaces and calling to their playmates, oh, we've played the flute for you, you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, you didn't mourn. John comes eating, uh, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, oh, he has a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. What's happening here? I think it's kind of obvious. What he's saying is that these people, they're acting like spoiled, entitled children. And there's a word, by the way, that if you want to, if I look around at our nation, <laughs> I see a bunch of spoiled, entitled children. I see a world that is just filled with spoiled and title. We sit there in judgment over the gospel, over God. Here is John the Baptist who's come at the cost of his life, not eating, not drinking, ascetic, out there in the wilderness, calling people to prepare for the holiness of God. And they're looking down at him, look at him. Oh, he has a demon. He's a, you know, look at this guy. Huh? And then Jesus comes and it's the opposite. Well, here, here's a guy for you. He's eating and drinking with sinners. Oh, look at this guy. What kind of holy man is this? We sit in judgment. Nothing's good enough for these guys, like children, like entitled, spoiled brats. Well, you're not what I'm looking for. I don't know. Maybe this one. And God's answer is really, really serious on this. Do not sit in judgment over God's anointed. Do not sit in judgment over this. This is your salvation. Do not be lukewarm about your salvation. This is life given to you. It's war. Yet wisdom is justified by our deeds. What's, what it's saying here is kind of like, you know, people are looking this way, that way, finding any excuse to reject it. But you look to the fruit. Jesus is always saying that. You look to the fruit and that's how you measure the thing. One commentator said this, this evil world rejects all who seek to overcome its evil. Some on one pretext, some on another, but true seekers after wisdom will welcome holiness in whatever form it may appear. In response to these things, I, I won't read it again, but Jesus then begins to denounce the cities because they've rejected it. Capernaum, you think it's going to go well for you. You're rejecting the gospel when it's come to your midst. I don't know if I need this. It's like, no, you're wretched, poor, pitiful, blind and naked. You need this salvation. It's going to be better for Sodom. If Sodom had heard this, they would have repented, is what Jesus says. The summary of all this, this is war. Holiness roots out everything. There's no middle ground when it comes. God is coming in and pulling people out of hellfire. That's what he did for me. He's pulling people out of hellfire and putting them into holy fire, if you could put it that way. So this, there's opposition here. The kingdom of God is not some graceful, uh, gradual thing, right? It doesn't fit with your existing life. I want to read something from James. James, at the moment, at least today, is my favorite epistle in Scripture. It may just be because I'm reading through it. But uh, anyone else love the epistle of James? It's so practical and uh, really wonderful. James 4, listen to these words. Man, it's right on target. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Here's the sentence I want you to hear. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do, you, or do you suppose it's no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. What is that saying? What it's saying is a gigantic warning to everyone. It's like in the midst of the good news of the gospel, remember this, remember this, remember this. Do not think that the world is neutral. Okay, I want to end with this. I'm just going to 
couple of things. It's this last verse is, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, Jesus says, in light of all the rest, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You say to yourself, okay, you're, you're a person thinking about becoming a Christian. And you say, I was thinking about it at first when you were all that stuff about come as you are, you don't have to do anything. I kind of like that. Don't do anything at all. I don't have to change my clothes. I don't have to change my party affiliation. I don't have to wear funny hats. I don't have to do anything. I'm loved as I am by God. This is really cool. Ah, but then you tell me in chapter 10 all this other stuff about persecution. This I'm not as crazy about. <laughs> I think I'm not going to become a Christian, at least not yet. You know why? Because it seems too much of a burden. Right? Too much of a burden. There is a fundamental misapprehension here that we need. This is what we're talking about. You think that the world is neutral. So many people think it's kind of like, well, the world is this neutral place and being a Christian adds a burden. It's like, no, look at the world aright and realize that you are in bondage and we are living in quicksand. If we are not in Christ, it is sinking sand and the world is a bondage. And Jesus has come to deliver us from it. In that sense, Christ's yoke is light. So I just want to review this. The kingdom of heaven is a matter of not of teaching or behavioral modification, but deliverance. I just, I'll speak about me just for a second. You know, when I first became a believer, I struggled with the weakness of my flesh. It seems like we live in a society that is, that is it, we do, I forget it seems, we definitely live in a society that is engineered against the weakness of our flesh. It's interesting. Think of the system we have. Think of it as that you're struggling with things. For me, I'll give you an easy one, right? I always, I just love food and I, I can't, you know, and it comes at you and it's just like this constant barrage of everything in front of you. It's like, eat, eat, eat. And then it's my fault when I eat. You know, it's like, it's my moral failure because the whole world is coming at me. Or, you know, darker things. It's kind of like we live in a world that's thoroughly pornographized. What's the word I'm trying to, pornography is everywhere. It's, it's just, in everywhere it comes at you and it's there it's these freely available and then it's on you well you don't have to look at it but we're coming up with the best minds in the world that are going to find it to you somehow and then it's all on you and we struggle with the weakness of our flesh and, and all these ways that it comes at us i was in bondage to my sins and i came to the lord and i was so grateful for it for the first time in my life, I, I had access to the throne of grace. I could stand up and say, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on me that I should be called the child of God. That's what I am. And I ran around in front of God. This is the interesting part. I didn't even know about holiness at all. I didn't know anything about the holiness of God, but I did know to draw near to him with confidence as a child to my father, able and ready to help me. I, like a child running around in the presence of his father, the king, without any care in the world. What to be afraid of? He's my father. Over time, this is the weirdest thing I want to share with you. Over time, I gradually began to grow up and you gradually become to be aware in fits and stages like, wow, my father is actually pretty cool. Like, actually awesome, beyond belief. My, my God is holy. Actually, he's holy. And you begin to look at your Savior and you realize the greatness of your Savior, even greater than you would ever imagine. And you begin to almost want to, it's not that you step back, but that you want to drop the knee. Say, praise God. Praise God that I have access here, but I never realized, even as I was running around in front of you like a child all these years, I never realized your greatness. That you took the sinner, you saved my life, you adopted me as a son. You called me as your servant. You've called me to be a holy one of God, a saint. And so I will help you, Lord. I will, I will walk in the paths as I'm able. That is a beautiful thing about the gospel message that I wanted to share with you today. Remember this, is that the gospel, the coming of the kingdom, is an invasion of darkness. It is a matter of deliverance. And do you remember our Father, which art in heaven, what it's saying there? Is that we're, it calls us to draw near to our Father. With what? With all holy reverence and with confidence. So let's do likewise and let this be our message to the world. There's no contradiction between the holiness of God and the love of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, for the blessing of your word, for the power of it, for the way that we can open scripture at any time of the day or night and hear your voice speaking to us. We can hear the very words of our Savior, Jesus, and how amazing it is that these words spoken and written 2,000 years ago, instead of kind of sounding like some dusty, distant echo, should speak with such power and resonance by your spirit right in our heart. So, Lord, we pray that you will work these words into our heart and then work it out into our hands and feet. We desire to be doers of your word. Above all, Heavenly Father, we desire to look to Jesus. As we leave this place today, help us to look to Jesus and know that he is our strength, that he is our hope, that 100% on the basis of what he's done, I can have assurance, we can have assurance, that you will never leave or forsake us, that we are surely held by a great and gracious God, that you are holy beyond all we can ask or imagine. And at the same time, Lord, you love us more than we can ask or imagine. So help us to serve you faithfully in the days ahead. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.